Today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Her Harold Jansen. Um, he is going to pose the question to us, is Trudeau mania once more alive and well in Canada? Um, and unpack the recent uh, federal election. Harold Jansen is a political scientist at the University of Lethbridge, interested in ways in which Canadians and Albertans interact with their governments through political parties and new technology. He completed his BA from the University of Alberta and earned his MA at Carleton University in Ottawa before returning to the University of Alberta and finishing his PhD in political science in 1998. He came to the University of Lethbridge shortly after that um, and has been here ever since. His research has focused on Alberta politics, electoral systems and electoral reform, Canadian political finance and the impact of the internet on political communication and de democratic citizenship. He's passionate about teaching and appreciates the opportunities um, which smaller universities offer in mentoring undergraduate students. Um, from 2013 to 2015, he served as one of the university's two Board of Governors um, teaching chairs, and on July 1st of this year, he became the chair of the Department of Political Science um, at the University of Lethbridge. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Harold Jansen. Well, thank you for that uh, warm welcome, and thank you for inviting me here. Now, I have a lot of material to cover. Uh, there's a lot to be said about the election, so some of it we'll have to leave for the question and answer period. Um, so we'll we'll get started now. I'm going to I'm going to confess to having done a bit of a bit bait and switch on you. I'm going to be a lot more political sciencey than focusing too much on Justin Trudeau, but I will talk about him because I think he was pretty central to this victory. So uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, win and be coming back to power is pretty amazing and it's a remarkable accomplishment that I don't think a lot of people would have predicted uh, even a couple of years ago. And that includes a lot of political scientists we are supposed to be experts on this. I could stack up quite a pile of books and articles of political scientists predicting the demise of the Liberal Party based on what we have seen. So I want to talk a little bit about why we as political scientists expected the Liberal Party to be doomed, uh, why I think the election turned out the way it did and what this might mean going forward. So let's first talk about the Liberals and why they looked uh, doomed. But before that, we need to go back. So I'm going to give you a brief history refresher course. Uh, don't worry, I'm a political scientist, not a historian. I can blow through 100, 100 years of Canadian history in about two minutes. It's just the important stuff where we'll skip all of the boring detail. So the Liberals have been described as Canada's natural governing party. And so why is that? And you can see evidence for this. I'm going to show you a little graph. The red represents years where the Liberals were in power and the blue years the Conservatives were in power between 1921 and 1984. It's not hard to see from this that the Liberals clearly dominated for a big chunk of the uh, 20th century. So the big question is, well, why did this happen? Why did the Liberal Party end up becoming one of the most successful political parties in democratic countries anywhere in the world? So the first point I'm going to make is that having one party that dominates is not an unusual thing in political systems. There's lots of countries where uh, we've seen a dominant party, like the Congress Party in uh, India or the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan or Fianna Fáil in Ireland are examples of other natural governing parties, Social Democrats in Scandinavian countries. But what's a little more odd about this is governing from the center. Being a dominant party and being in the middle of the ideological spectrum is difficult because you've got competitors to your left, which I just pulled this color out of thin air, I colored them orange, and the party, our party to the right, which I also for some reason chose the color blue. So here's the problem for centrist parties. You get attacked from both sides. So you could have the party to your left increase and move into your territory ideologically, snatching voters from you on the left. Conversely, you can also have parties coming at you from the right. Now, the problem is, as a centrist party, you might try, you can also go either way. But what typically happens as you shift more to the left, then the conservative party moves in, the right party moves in and takes your voters because you've gone too far away. So it's a difficult position. And the real nightmare scenario is this one, where both parties move in and take your voters. And, and this is typically what we see with centrist parties. So if you think of the Liberal 
uh, Democratic Party in the UK, basically a centrist party between the Conservatives and Labour, and they have a tough time defending their ideological turf. They're fighting a two-front war, and that's difficult. So why were the Liberals able to avoid this fate for so long? Well, there's one big answer to it, and that's this, Quebec. So here's where we're going to go back in Canadian history very quickly. Nothing really mattered in Canadian history until 1896. I see Malcolm uh, Greenshields here, so he'll report that back to the historians at the University of Lethbridge. Um, Wilfrid Laurier figured out in 1896 how to tame the anti-Catholic sentiments within the Liberal Party. He managed to figure out how to make the Liberals palatable in Quebec. And that was a really important election in terms of setting up the Liberals for success. Now this was exacerbated in 1917 when the Conservative government, it was mostly Conservative in World War I, in 1917 implemented conscription. Quebec, uh, Quebec voters were not very keen on this to say the least. This is called the conscription crisis for a reason. And this pretty much doomed the Conservatives in Quebec and cemented the Liberals' place. And so the next election after that was 1921 where you saw that nice, neat little graph. And the Liberals dominated Canadian politics. And a lot of that domination rested in Quebec. Now I'm old enough to remember elections like the 1980 elections where the Liberals won 74 of 75 seats in Quebec. That's incredible, right? You're more than halfway to a majority government from one province. So the Liberal domination of Quebec meant that there was only one, country, one party that could actually tie the country together. And the big thing we were concerned about was bridging this gap between French and English. And that party was the Liberal Party. Now, this unraveled, and the Liberal Party got into trouble when this started to fall apart. And there were two things that really did this. The first is Quebec's provincial government. This is the very top of Quebec's Assemblée Nationale. And um, Quebec's provincial government said, you know what, we don't need the Liberal Party to speak for Quebec. And we don't need Quebec MPs in the federal parliament to speak for Quebec. We as the provincial government of Quebec will speak for Quebec. And increasingly what had been done within the Liberal Party was now done between the federal prime minister and the federal government speaking to the provincial government and the provincial premier of Quebec. The second big thing was this. This is the headline from September 5th, 1984's Globe and Mail. 1984, Brian Mulroney wins one of the biggest majority governments in Canadian history. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this little bit on the side here. Quebec fortress crumbles to the Conservatives. The Liberals lost that support in Quebec. They lost that support base. And even when Canadians threw the Conservatives out in a big way in 1993, you'll notice that Quebec voters didn't go back to the Liberals. They did better there, but the Bloc Québécois won a majority of the MPs in Quebec. And they continued to win a majority of MPs until 2011. But again, they didn't go back to the, to the Liberals. They went to the NDP in 2011. So this loss of their fortress in Quebec was a huge development. So now, not only did, were they not needed to bridge the French-English gap, but they were also actually, in some ways, incapable of doing it. And this means that the logic of being a centrist party starts to kick in. So political scientists who had been predicting that the uh, Liberal Party would die off, I mean, or I want to call a few of them up. I was having lunch with a colleague in, uh, in July, not here at the university, a colleague from another university who was um, basically very confidently predicting that the Liberals would die after this election. This was the, I, I really need to give him a call and ask him <laughs> if he's still standing by that. But there were good reasons for looking at that because here's what their popular vote numbers looked like over the last uh, 20 years or so. So you can see 93, 97, and 2000, they won again. They, they were doing quite well. They were winning about 40% of the vote. Now the thing I'll also point out is that was a lower share of the popular vote than they typically gotten in their other periods of dominance. It, from 1921 through uh, 1984, they were doing quite a bit better than that. So the Liberal Party, when it would come back, would tend to do so at a lower level. But then we saw this decline kick in. And if you were to extend that line, right, we would expect the Liberals to be around 12 or 13 percent in this election at the rate they were going. So let's just plot what happened in 2015 on there. So basically Justin Trudeau restored the Liberal Party's popularity back to where it was in the 1990s. What's pretty amazing, so this, this uh, collapse of the Liberals' ability to bridge the French-English 
difference and their weaker basis of electoral support was masked a little bit through the 90s uh, because of the split vote on the right. The opposition was incredibly fragmented. The NDP was weak and dispirited. We had the progressive conservatives still hanging around. We had the Reform Party, then the Canadian Alliance. Once Stephen Harper managed to help union, uh, unify the conservatives and Jack Layton reinvigorated the NDP, then the liberal decline kicked in. But Justin Trudeau reversed this. So the big question is how? There's lots of reasons. I'm going to focus on three that I think are particularly important. One is, again, the question of ideological positioning. So here's a bit of the problem the Liberals were facing, is that the NDP and Thomas Mulcair were trying to position themselves to be in a position to govern. So they were essentially moving in on the Liberals' turf. If you watched the NDP campaign, um, Mr. Mulcair was campaigning on things like balanced budget. Uh, there was a point during the economic debate that was actually quite amusing to me uh, where uh, Justin Trudeau is defending uh, making wealthier people pay more and middle classes getting tax cuts. And Thomas Mulcair is kind of defending the status quo uh, tax system, which is an odd position for a new Democrat leader to be in, and defending the need for balanced budgets as opposed to Justin Trudeau running on deficits. So Mulcair is moving into the center. So instead of being squeezed, Justin Trudeau performs something pretty amazing. On economic policy, he jumps around the NDP. So he says, I'm going to run a deficit. I'm going to make the wealthier pay more. On these very important economic and fiscal issues, he jumps around to the left of the NDP. Really clever, hard to pull off. The Liberals did it in Ontario, which is where I think they got this idea. This was basically Kathleen Wynne's campaign. But they managed to do this. And then from this, right, the Liberals are nicely positioned in the center. They start to move on the left, and they start to move in. Now, on some issues having to do with security and international relations, where the uh, Conservatives were tending to really try to box the Liberals in, he, uh, the Liberals and Justin Trudeau actually were in, in favor of Bill C-51. They actually were closer to the Conservatives in a lot of ways than the NDP. And this is one of the benefits of being a centrist party. You can be ideological flexible. But this, this move, especially on these issues, which are really near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, uh, and made a lot of noise, it distinguished the Liberals in a profound way, but it did it to the left. And the NDP ended up defending a status quo, which was an unusual position for them. Second thing is that it's very clear that the Liberals ran an extremely effective campaign. Uh, now, I ju just I should have said this earlier. I'm not a member of any political party. I don't have a, uh, a stake in this. I'm just sort of interested as a political scientist. And this was, I thought, a remarkably good campaign. It, it didn't misfire very much. There were some memorable moments. There was some, some extremely effective advertising, which I'll talk about. The big thing we saw in voters in this election was there was this overwhelming desire for change. Poll after poll showed this. A lot of voters wanted the Conservatives out. They wanted something different. But here's the question. Who was going to be the agent of that change? Was it going to be the Liberals or the New Democrats? Who was it going to be? And over the course of the election, that seemed to get answered. So uh, this is Nanos Research. I snipped this off their website. And um, they, they did the best tracking polls. If you look at their numbers at the end, they were almost bang on at the end. The polling was very accurate. Nanos always does a very, very good job and was, again, very successful. But you can see a really close three-way race early on, right, till about halfway through. And this is just from September because, let's face it, I wasn't even paying attention to the election in August, and I, and I get paid to pay attention. Um, so halfway through, by about the end of September, you can see the NDP starts to drop, and increasingly, the Liberals, voters decide, are the agent for change. So why is this? Well, we need to talk a little bit about the NDP campaign to answer that. So with the NDP, they ran a very uh, careful campaign. And I'd call it they were really campaigning on a change without real change. Because they were, in a lot of ways, uh, in some of the debates, Mr. Mulcair was sounding a lot more like Mr. Harper than it was like what you would expect an NDP premier or a, pri a leader, sorry, to sound like. Now, part of this is because the NDP historically isn't trusted very much with economic or fiscal policy. So they're on a shorter leash from voters. When NDP premiers say, or a leader would say, oh, I'm going to run a deficit, 
everyone right away thinks, oh, Bob Ray, right? Bob Ray ruined Ontario's economy. So the NDP has to proceed cautiously on these kinds of issues. But it made them very conservative. But the other thing is that it also reflected a front-runner campaign. They were ahead in the polls going in, and they played it extremely safe. They didn't do anything daring. So to me, the other thing besides being a political scientist is I'm also a huge fan of the Edmonton Oilers. So I'm really good. I also, the other thing I know a lot about is really poor hockey playing and very ineffective hockey strategy because as I said, I'm an Oilers strategy. So this was to me, it was like the NDP scored a goal in the first five minutes into the first period and then tried to defend the lead for the next 55 minutes. And it didn't work very well. I've asked my students, some of whom are New Democrats, name one defining moment of the NDP campaign. And you can't really think of one, right? It, it was this big mush. It was a very confused message. It wasn't clear. There wasn't a very strong narrative arc on this. Now, when you contrast this with the Liberals, the Liberals really were big on change. So the pictures you're seeing from the Liberal campaign are from Justin Trudeau's Flickr account. And it's actually really hard to find a picture that doesn't have the word change in it. Um, so change was everywhere. They were campaigning on a change of government, a change in leader, a change in, in tone and style, and a change in policy, especially the orthodoxy of balanced budgets. And so everything came down to change. Whereas the NDP was about change without change, um, the Liberal campaign very effectively communicated change uh, as opposed to continuity. So I was very struck by this, especially in the last week of the campaign. Like many people, I was watching the, uh, the Blue Jays, and the bad part about watching the Blue Jays was the commercial breaks between uh, half innings when you'd have to sit through commercial after commercial after commercial. Um, you understand why voters get turned off by politics when you see that, right? And so the Conservatives ran, you, I'm sure if you watched TV at all in, the, uh, in October, uh, you saw this at some point, right? These attack ads, attack ads. The Conservatives were going almost scorched earth with negative campaigning against Justin Trudeau. The Liberals ran this really amazing ad, and I don't know if you saw this one, where Justin Trudeau's speaking to a rally. It's about hope, about how they're ready, and uh, it was a real contrast. And it was a change in tone, a change in style, and it was a very effective counter, because you'd often see three conservative ads, and then this one would come on, which was happy and upbeat. It contrasted things tremendously. Third factor is leadership, and here's the Trudeau mania part. So I'm going to uh, teach you a little bit about voting behavior. So political scientists know three things about leadership. The first is that leadership really matters in predicting the vote. It's one of the most important things in terms of how um, voters make up their mind, is how they think about the leaders. But the interesting thing is there's actually two dimensions to leadership. We talk about different traits that affect how we evaluate leaders and then how that affects the vote. And there's two big parts to this. One is character. So in political science, we tend to look at whether we ask people questions, whether they think the uh, leader is empathetic, whether caring, they're compassionate, they're honest, they're trustworthy. So that's the character side. The other side is the competence side, whether the leaders are strong leaders, whether they're intelligent. Now, here's the other big thing that we know is that character matters more than competence for voters. And that may surprise you. You would think, oh, I want somebody really smart running a job, but actually, character, and there's been a lot of research done on this, actually affect leader evaluations more and affects the vote more. And here I'm going out on a limb because I don't have data and we won't have data for this for a few months yet uh, once the survey research has been cleaned up. But I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that Justin Trudeau won the character battle. There is no question that he was seen as more likable, relatable, empathetic. Um, and he's, he's, he's a likable guy. He's charismatic. And um, the, the, the piece of evidence I can point to, Abacus Data, a polling company in Ottawa, did a really interesting survey. And they're, they're silly questions, but they actually do get at this. So who would you trust, to, who would you want to babysit your children? Who would you want to go out for dinner with? Who would you want to negotiate on your behalf for a contract? And it's kind of a funny, funny survey in a way, but it actually really got on this. On anything having to do with character and likability and empathy, uh, Justin Trudeau was hands down the winner. Like I said, political science research tells us character matters more than competence. And I actually think the, um, the uh, conservative attack ads, and you have to have seen this one because it ran for about the last two and a half years. Um, 
But even this ad, if you'll remember, the, the tone of the ad was, yeah, Justin Trudeau's a really nice guy. He's very likable. The conservatives, even in their advertising, were conceding. Justin Trudeau's a nice, likable guy, but they're focusing on the competence side, which matters less. And actually, there was an ad that uh, the conservatives, when they started to tank in the campaign, they ran, which where they said, you know, the... Um, where Stephen Harper looks at the camera, you know, this election isn't about me. Like, don't worry about whether you like me or not, right? It's about policy. So they completely conceded the character debate. Um, and the other thing about uh, Justin Trudeau is that Justin Trudeau came across as authentic. You really felt like he was who he was. There were attempts to try to make uh, both Thomas Mulcair and uh, Stephen Harper more relatable. Like, if you watch ads in the last half, uh, Stephen Harper appears, he's not wearing a tie or a jacket, right? He's wearing a shirt and he's smiling at the camera, which not a great look for uh, Stephen Harper, I would suggest. Thomas Mulcair also, but the problem is those seemed faked and inauthentic, whereas Justin Trudeau, it felt authentic. I'm going to also point out uh, this, because this is going to come up later. The Liberals also did very much benefit from a divided vote and the effect of our electoral system. So yes, they, they want a majority government, and people are calling it this really strong majority. I don't actually think it's 54% is a comfortable majority. I don't think it's any kind of a landslide uh, or anything, and it's, I've been a bit overplayed. But it is resting on 39.5% of the popular vote. And in recent Canadian history, uh, there are only two other elections where it's been lower than that. Um, so that's not overwhelming. They also did much better in Ontario than you would have expected. Every 1% of the vote translated into about 1.5% of the seats, and every 1% of the vote translated to 1.5% of the seats in Quebec. Now, this explains why, um, I think, why they got a majority government. The vote really splintered in a very favorable way for the Liberals and put them over the top from a minority to a majority. And I know this because on October 19th, all through the day at work, people were asking me, so what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I quite confidently said, it's going to be a liberal minority government. And then well, I watched the results come in, and then we started to see this, and then I realized, wow, this is going to be a majority. So I just worked at home the next day because I had a lot to answer for. <laughs> um, and people had forgotten about it by Wednesday, thankfully. So, But I think this really is it. They did better, but the electoral system made it look stronger than it was. So the big question, now what? Now you've noticed I haven't talked a lot about the Conservatives. There is a saying that, um, that uh, opposition parties don't win elections, governments lose them. And so I've been thinking a little about this, and I'm starting to think that this election probably wasn't even winnable for the Conservatives. Because leadership matters a lot, and all the polling was showing people had had enough of Stephen Harper. Um, the survey research has been showing that continually. Their big strong point is the economy. Well, we're in a recession, right? And there were signs. They'd have to play with the numbers and play with the math. But there were signs that things were not good. And the overwhelming media coverage was this narrative, we're in recession. Um, the other thing that they were very strong on is security foreign policy. Here's another thing we know from studies of voting behavior. Voters don't use that very much to make up their mind for whom to vote. It's not a central issue. It matters very little to most voters. So they had a lot of negatives. So the big question is, well, where do they go from here? Well, I, I don't think the Conservatives should be too distraught over this because, I mean, the big thing is they got 31.9% of the vote. So the Conservatives have a very established core base of support. And in political science research, we call them party identifiers. And they retain their identifiers. This is not 1993 for the Conservatives. They lost. They weren't wiped out. They weren't fundamentally restructured. They lost. They have a lot of MPs. They can rebuild. Now, the choice of leader is going to be a very interesting challenge for them because there are still some underlying tensions between the, about the merger a decade ago between the Progressive Conservatives and the Canadian Alliance that have been basically subsumed by having been in power. But those are going to start to emerge a little bit, so that will be challenging. If there's anyone I kind of feel most sorry for, it's probably the NDP and uh, Thomas Mulcair because I mean, they had a lot of hopes going in and were in a nice position. But I'd argue they were lulled into a false sense of security by the 2011 results. It was very dependent on Quebec. 
And the thing that the research has been showing for the last few years is that, yes, Quebec voters voted in 2011, but the sense that this was a core vote or a dependent vote, that these were party identifiers, didn't really come out, right? That was not a – they weren't able to translate these into long-term supporters. So it looked much more impressive than it actually was. So uh, again, I'd argue the NDP ran a kind of confused message. It wasn't a clear uh, sort of camp campaign in my mind. Now the challenge for them going forward is they need to figure out what they want to do. Do they want to contend for power or are they going to go back to the 70s and 80s where they were the conscience of parliament, right, where everyone respected and liked them but didn't want them in power? And that will have to do with ideological positioning. Are they going to be more centrist or are they going to uh, become uh, a little more ideologically, move back and be more left? Um, and that's a difficult debate. Often when parties lose, they more, move more to the left. Now Mulcair is a brilliant parliamentarian, was not as effective as the centerpiece of an election campaign and that came out. So what's going to happen for the Liberals? I think the key lesson for them is don't be too complacent because, as I said, 55% has been portrayed as a large majority and I'd say it's comfortable but not overwhelming. They want a majority with 39% of the vote. It's one of the lower ones we've seen in Canadian history and it was very dependent on a real fragmentation of opposition votes in Ontario and especially in Quebec, that majority. Um, so that's going to be tricky. Now part of the problem is they campaigned on hope and change, but that also raises the expectations of voters. The Conservatives during the campaign lowered our expectations of Justin Trudeau and he exceeded them by just merely appearing coherent. But now there's been this raising the sign, raising the hopes, right? This is going to be fundamental change and we're going to be hopeful. And that's tricky to deliver on. You can ask Barack Obama about running a campaign on hope and then the crushing disappointment of your supporters a few years later. So he'll need to de uh, deliver on a, some of the key promises in the short term. Uh, so the tax changes I think were a signature policy for him and he will have to move and want to move quickly on that. There are some long term changes such as electoral reform which is something that Peter McCormick who's here today and I've been exchanging emails about it all week. Uh, more evidence-based policy making like the long-term census. But a big thing is a change in tone and I picked this picture for a reason. Um, we're already seeing this, right? Justin Trudeau ran, held a press conference where he took questions from the media the day after election and the media were falling all over themselves because this hasn't happened for them in almost a decade. And the goodwill that that generated was amazing. But here's the thing, running a more open and democratic government always looks good when you're an opposition party. It's much less attractive when you're in government. And so whether he can deliver on that will be tricky. So the big question for the Liberals is you've raised expectations, can you or will you deliver? So to conclude, the Liberals uh, did extremely well. But I don't think we've ushered in a new period like 1921 to 1984 where the Liberals are going to win three quarters of the time. Um, they'll still face, they still face that challenge that they're governing from the center, which gives them ideological flexibility, but they're vulnerable on both, on both sides. The electoral foundations are not rock solid. There is some weakness there. And Trudeau's popularity is only going to last so long. Once he actually starts doing things and disappointing people, uh, things are going to get a lot more difficult. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions after lunch.